Welcome everybody, I'm John Boylan, the president of the Dulles Regional Chamber of Commerce. Dulles sits in a great footprint, only 20 miles from Washington, D.C., the nation's capital of the United States, but more importantly, uh, right next to Dulles Airport, uh, international, 55 international destinations. Over a year ago, we had the opportunity with some of my board members to meet Peter Sanders, and they said, John, you've got to meet this guy. He's amazing, he, he's really got some big thoughts, and so I met Peter, and I was equally impressed. And we started talking about Brexit. I was concerned about change. Anytime there's change in business, you know, there's concern and worry, but there's also opportunity. And so with Brexit, whatever happened, we had our discussion about potentially there might be some needs for the U.S. to step up and help. And so we've had extended discussions with, with Peter and his team about how we can be able to uh, help them and work with U.S. to Europe exports. So we're going to learn more from Peter and his team. But first, I want to thank our host today, Jan Wool from uh, Fairfax County Economic Development. Jan, if you just welcome everybody and uh, appreciate it. Thanks. I'll soon do that. Thank you, John, and good morning, everybody. My name is Jan Wool. I'm the uh, Director of International Marketing for the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. And in this capacity, we're working with a lot of partners around the globe. And today, we are very pleased to have US to Europe both here as well as in the Zoom meeting. And I think this is a nice moment to introduce the MC of today, Peter. Do I have to talk to the... No, you're fine. Just don't worry about it. No, no. Talk to you guys. That's right. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you for having us, uh, uh, Jan, for your hospitality. Uh, we, uh, we are here despite the, the snow and, and the emergency situation of your country, but yet we're all here together, so <laughs> that's, that's really good. Uh, we, we share, in fact, more... You say you're from Fairfax County, you're originally from Den Haag, yeah. right, which is my city where I'm born and partly raised, so uh, that's, uh, that's how we bond a bit. Uh, really glad to be here, maybe to give you a little bit of bearings on who I am and how this all came about. Uh, I run an office in, uh, in the Netherlands, in The Hague, so the Netherlands being just in between, very near to the UK and, and that topic of and Brexit is something that Stan has come to touch on, so I won't go, go into that right now. So in between UK in one end, Germany in the other end. What we do is we assist uh, companies with uh, their export mainly. We do the investment promotion part, but I would say 60%, 70% of what we do is trade promotion, assisting companies with their market entry into new markets. Uh, my wife, who is mother of my children, uh, she's my wife, and she's my managing partner, so we have to level on these three levels each and every day, and we work it out, and when we don't, we just hang out, but it works. <laughs> uh, she's German, uh, she's uh, born in Frankfurt, raised in Berlin, uh, so part of what we do is, uh, is very strongly focused on the German-speaking area, with German-speaking people in, in the country, so we feel that is a good position where also something Stan is going to touch on. We think that the Netherlands is a very good point of entry into uh, the European zone. Uh, and Germany, of course, is a very important economic power. So uh, if we need to assist companies in other areas, we do that with, with partners. I didn't do it. <laughs> So the main, the key word for what we do is, is market, market entry assistance. I would say that is the most important part of, of our work. Uh, we have been working for uh, U.S. companies and then in particular Pennsylvania companies now for, for 10 years. Uh, when we started out, the, they tracked the sales uh, in, in our region, which is the region that we cover for. 25,000, it's now going towards 4 million. So, uh, and that is uh, uh, sales that have, have been attributed to our office. Doesn't mean that we brought this all about, mm -hmm. but we helped to facilitate and sort of accelerate the process. Having been there very often, I got a lot of questions and I didn't have a clue what to do with them. And I pulled the same face I'm pulling to you right now as if I knew everything about. 
how this is something will ask me a question say so how about CE marking I said I won't know I'll handle that for you I didn't have a clue and I couldn't mm -hmm. uh, and there that at that point I found out there are a lot of specific areas that I have to deal with that I don't know about and I need a group <coughs> around me and behind me to to assist me in that area and that is how some something which is now called US Europe came about uh, I, I have some flyers here that I can show you. So it, we've divided it up in, in four areas, being uh, trade, in which I myself, compliance, anything having to do with the CE marking, uh, reach, when it's in the chemical area, uh, what else do we have, uh, tax and legal, uh, and of course the logistics part. And in the beginning, uh, we teamed up with a logistical company and Honest, it, it brought me in a situation where I didn't want to be because I then had to say, as let's say the authorized trade representative, you have to go to that company. And I don't know if that one company would always be the best for that particular situation. And that is how Stan and I met. Stan works for the Holland International Distribution Council, which is you're going to explain that. Mm -hmm has a member base of around 300 companies, a lot of them are in the logistical area, and that I like a lot, because in that situation, Stan would uh, be, let's say, a partner with us, uh, it's, it's not a membership based thing, as US Europe is, it's not an entity, it's just a partnership. Um, and I think it was about two years ago when I was in Washington, uh, and I met some people from uh, your board, that is how the ball started rolling uh, with the Dallas Chamber, saying, well, why wouldn't we partner with the Dallas Chamber and get some traction here and get people to know us? Because our interest isn't sort of sell US to Europe. We, these are all people that think that they're specialists in their own area, and they are, uh, that like to engage with companies uh, in, in the US and maybe help them out. And so that is why we connected here on Zoom with uh, a large, with a number of people that are involved in US Europe that are going to participate later on. Um, and I think that we'll do at the end. And we'll now start with your presentation. And then we'll have give a chance to everyone to briefly introduce themselves. Maybe speak a few words. I thought we had less time, so I cut them really short. Uh, but I think that's okay. So uh, as uh, Peter mentioned, we, um, we are an association of uh, logistics companies. We actually uh, uh, have existed for more than 30 years and uh, back then we saw a big move of manufacturing from Europe to lower wage countries and that me meant that trade flows would increase uh, across global uh, trade flows and uh, a lot of these companies they were looking for location to import products and from where they could distribute across Europe. So that's where the Netherlands came in. Shall I use this to... Uh... All right. <coughs> um, and we were established by the logistics industry that saw this opportunity. <coughs> so um, for the last 30 years, we've been involved in uh, working with uh, US companies that were looking for a logistics and distribution base and of course the landscape has changed a lot but our mission hasn't and uh, still very much re relevant as Europe is becoming a large
larger and more interesting market, but it is still uh, quite uh, complicated, I would say, or maybe we could say interesting continent uh, to do business, where uh, a good logistics and supply chain setup is crucial. <clears throat> so these are the, the topics I want to talk about today, uh, very briefly about us, so you, you understand who is, uh, who is speaking here. Um, I will talk about um, how it works to enter the European market from a supply chain or logistics perspective. Um, I will briefly talk about supply chain models and I will touch on various models for various companies. Uh, I believe that there are a couple of people here that are interested in the e-commerce field, which is I think the biggest trend currently in logistics, so I will definitely talk about that. I will talk about customs and VAT. Uh, unfortunately, that's something a company needs to deal with, uh, value-added tax, which is not necessarily the most fun subject, but it's crucial that, uh, that a company that comes to Europe understands it and manages it in a good way. Um, <coughs> and uh, I will talk about uh, Brexit, obviously. Brexit is, uh, is probably the biggest disruptor in, uh, in supply chains uh, nowadays, potential disruptor. We're not there yet, but it's, it's awfully close. <clears throat> so about HIDC, we're from Holland, as you can see, that's, uh, that's our flag. Um, we have about 300 members and our mission is to promote the Netherlands as the gateway to Europe. Uh, we do that on behalf of uh, the Dutch logistics industry, which is, uh, I would say, a, a broad variety of different organizations and companies that all have something in common, which is they benefit from the the logistic hub function of, uh, of the Netherlands. As you can see here uh, in this uh, image, um, the core of our uh, membership base is logistic service providers. They vary from the larger ones that you, you all know, such as uh, <coughs> DHL and XPO and UPS, FedEx, Expediters, uh, a lot of U US companies actually. But we also have a lot of more specialized logistics service providers, which are homegrown from the Netherlands, uh, or they are from other countries. But what they all have in common is that they use the Netherlands as a, as a gateway. So UPS, as an example, they have massive facilities in the Netherlands for their supply chain activities. So for life sciences and e-commerce, they actually use the Netherlands as their base for, for Europe. Um, around that core, we have all kinds of organizations. We have uh, shipping companies, we have uh, business service providers, we have, of course, the ports and airports of the Netherlands, so the infrastructural backbone, um, Port of Rotterdam, Amsterdam Airport. Uh, we have regions and cities that are strong in logistics. <coughs> we have banks, we have uh, staffing agencies. So it's, it's, it's a broad variety, and uh, they all uh, contribute to our mission. Uh, what do I focus on? And together with me, a group of uh, project managers, um, we focus on companies that need assistance in their export to Europe. Uh, I personally focus on North America, so uh, that's basically the northeast and the south of the uh, US and Canada. And uh, we help companies with their entry into Europe from a supply chain perspective. So some of these companies are new to Europe, they can be quite successful companies in the US, uh, but Europe is new to them, and then we provide them with tailor-made advice specific for their product and for their sales camp. We also work with companies that already have a supply chain in Europe, which has grown organically or maybe by mergers and acquisitions, and we think, how can we optimize this? And would the Netherlands potentially be a good location for a centralized warehouse? We focus on, uh, on multiple industries. Uh, we have specific knowledge on those industries. Our services are free of charge. We're a nonprofit association, so we can offer our services free of charge and uh, without any obligations. <coughs> so this is Europe by night, as you can see. And I like to use this picture because you can see where the Europeans live. And um, you can see the biggest cluster is right there. That's, that's where the Netherlands and Belgium are. A lot of people on a small patch of land. Um, and uh, 
well, you can see, and I'll, I'll go into it a, a bit more, Europe is a big market, but it's quite concentrated in a few places. And from a logistics perspective, obviously, that's, uh, that's important. Um, most companies do realize that uh, Europe is a big market, um, but they don't necessarily realize that it's one of the, well, it's the second largest consumer market in the world. Because the European Union is, in fact, a single market. If you get your product into the European Union, you're free to distribute. So there's a free flow of goods to all those 512 uh, million consumers. You can see it's made up from three major markets, UK, France, and, uh, and uh, Germany. Unfortunately, it looks like the United Kingdom will be uh, exiting the European Union. So the single market will become a bit smaller, but still it is a massive market. And the United Kingdom will still be there. It's not that we, they're pushed away or <laughs> anything. They will still be there and they will still have a lot of buying power. <clears throat> so this is uh, what I refer to. If you look at the density of population in Europe, uh, it, it is actually concentrated in, in this small banana-shaped area, which we call the blue banana. <laughs> Don't ask me why it's blue. Um, it, maybe yellow was too common, so they called it blue. Uh, you can see that um, the concentration, the, the redder it is, the, the more dense it is, runs from uh, the south, so, so England, across to Benelux, Netherlands, Belgium, down uh, Germany, and to northern Italy. This represents about half of the European buying power. So if you get product into here, you have a good reach to a lot of consumers. <coughs> so if you look at the data, and of course, data, um, we look at the, the figures, import figures from outside of Europe, but this is only product that comes from overseas. You can see that the biggest importer is Germany, which makes sense, it's the, by far the largest industrial market, there's a lot of product uh, going into uh, Germany, um, assembled, manufactured, and then exported again. It's also the largest domestic market. <coughs> So a lot of product is imported directly into uh, Germany. It's followed by the UK, and it's roughly the same size in terms of import as the Netherlands, uh, which is uh, peculiar because uh, uh, the Netherlands has, has a much smaller uh, domestic market, only 17.17 million inhabitants. So the, the logical conclusion is most of the imports into the Netherlands is actually re-exported. So we're really a, a transshipment country. Not only transfer shipment, a lot of product actually uh, gets uh, value added. So uh, a lot of product is being imported, customized, assembled, specified for European customers, and then shipped onward towards uh, the different markets. <coughs> Key job. Um, another reason why uh, why there's so much imports into the Netherlands is because of its infrastructure. Uh, the largest port in Europe is the port of Rotterdam, by far, uh, in terms of uh, tonnage, but also in terms of containers. So last year there was about 14 and a half million containers um, coming into uh, Rotterdam. Um, there's significant growth uh, on that figure, mainly because uh, the port of Rotterdam is actually built into the sea, so uh, on reclaimed land. So the largest vessels, they can enter 24-7 into the port. And they can be handled by very modern, state-of-the-art, automated uh, uh, terminals. Um, these, these containers are taken off the vessel and then put on either uh, short sea vessels and then shipped to the rest of Europe onto barge, onto rail. And if that's all not possible, it will be put on a truck. But uh, there's, there's a lot of different options. Uh, and there's a lot of there's, there's not a lot of risk, so if there is any issue on the road, there's always alternatives. Um, another important uh, main port is the Amsterdam Airport, which has a lot of direct flights uh, into North, North America, but also into Asia, uh, which is good for cargo, because then there's, there's a lot of different destinations to import cargo from, but also distribute throughout uh, the, uh, the region. Uh, and it's good to get people in, obviously. <coughs> I would like to point out 
because uh, something has become more and more important, uh, especially in logistics. Data is, is really uh, defining uh, whether a supply chain is organized well or not. Uh, so it's important to have good connections. And uh, the second largest uh, uh, internet exchange is in Amsterdam. So companies, they enjoy the fact that they are connected through these, these different ways uh, to the rest of the world. So when a product is inside the Netherlands, you're free to bring it anywhere into the European Union, and it's generally quite close. So getting into Germany or France, it takes you maximum two days with regular road freight. The UK as well, two or three days. Uh, hopefully it will stay that way. We'll see after 29th of March. There may be some delays there. But for now, uh, you can cover most of Europe uh, with very cost-efficient uh, transport within one or two days. Of course, there's 24 hour express services, there's a lot of different parcel carriers. <coughs> All right, um, so, so that was basically when you enter the European Union. When you're inside, as a company, as an exporter, there's, there's different ways to, uh, to distribute products to, uh, uh, to your customers. And there's a lot of companies, when they start out exporting, they employ an indirect model, uh, which means that when they have they find a client at a trade show, for example, they speak to a potential client and uh, they say, I love your products, I want to put it on stock, sell it uh, on your behalf, I'll import it, I'll, I'll, I'll buy a container, and uh, I'll start selling it on your behalf, which, is, which would be lovely, right? <laughs> if you find a client like that, that's perfect, and you ship the container, maybe you don't even need to ship it, you just put it outside of your facility, <laughs> and then they pick it up. Which, in a, in a perfect world, if every country in Europe has a client like that, that would be perfect. Except for some companies, if they have a very nice, high-demand product, that works. Um, so this is, this is good for the exporter. Maybe you can't really call yourself an exporter then, but it's good for, for the foreign shipper, because you don't have to worry about a lot of difficult stuff such as importing and value-added tax and all, all those things are organized by your client. So your client, he manages the shipping, he pays the import duties and the taxes. He is your importer of record, but he's also responsible for your product in the European market. So this is good, and if you can gain market share in Europe like this, it's perfect. But for a lot of companies, that's, that's unfortunately not the case because their, cost, their customers are quite demanding, probably. Um, if you're on a trade show and you speak to a client, good chance that they say, I love your product, but I don't want a cool container because I'm not sure. Well, I don't want to finance it or it's just too much. I don't want to be responsible for your product. It brings too much risk. I want to start with one pallet and I want to have it next week. Uh, and uh, I want to live, have it delivered at my doorstep uh, with a full invoice with uh, all costs. So it's, it's probably more realistic that as a, as a US company you find those types of clients. <coughs> and then as a US company you want to learn about the European market, right? So you want to have direct contact with your end client. You want to know exactly what are their needs, how does my product or service fit, those needs, how should, should I adjust it? So you need market intelligence, and if there's a massive distributor between that, then there's not necessarily the best information. Perhaps you can sell the product to yourself in the best way. Good chance, probably, you know the product best. Um, for online, for e-commerce, it's become more and more important that there's a good return service as well. So you can sell it and ship it from the US, uh, there are nice solutions, uh, so like, like iParcel by UPS. I'm not sure if you are familiar with iParcel, but that's a service as, a, as an online uh, seller. You can at, at checkout you have a, uh, you have a module from UPS. You can implement on your web shop, and that module says, okay, you're shipping to the Netherlands. Then you have to add 21% uh, value added tax, this much shipping costs, and import duties. So the total cost is one and a half times as high as the product cost, right? And then, uh, then in a couple of days it's delivered. So it is an option to do it like that. But how do you organize the return? If, if the 
consumer doesn't like it, we cannot ask them to ship it back to the US. So if, uh, if you want to have a, a proper return option, it is better to, uh, to organize it in a different way. Um, of course, the, you're always thinking about, am I making enough on my product? So is my distributor not making more profit on my product than I do myself? So these are all thoughts that uh, may pop up sell in an indirect way. <coughs> so um, a next step for a lot of exporters is to go from indirect to direct, which means having a stock location somewhere in Europe and organizing logistics yourself. That means that as a manufacturer or trader or brand, uh, you have a presence in Europe, not necessarily with an office or your own folks uh, doing the up and ground work. <coughs> but you have uh, your product in market and you can fulfill orders properly. That means you have shorter lead times, you can customize products close to the market. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but in, in the UK there's a different plug on, on electronics, <laughs> which can be uh, quite uh, a hassle if uh, you know, have an integrated plug into your product, because then you always have too much for UK market and too little for in Europe, or the other way around. So a lot of companies, they choose to add a plug uh, in, uh, in Europe as soon as the order comes in. So that's, that's an easy example. Um, it can also be a manual that is printed in, a, in the right language, for example. Returns we talked about, um, you can lower overall costs if you ship every individual shipment across Atlantic, then obviously the total costs are a lot higher than when, sh when you ship in bulk to one single location in Europe, and from there, do the finest uh, distribution. And you're exempt of prepaying import VAT, which I will explain later a little bit more, and is a very interesting benefit for, for overseas companies. For your customer, it's, it's a nice uh, proposition because uh, it's, it's a lot easier for them to order from you, because you can get full pricing, you have one invoice covering the product, the transportation, the duties, and the taxes, it is a cross-border sale uh, within Europe, and that means that you can sell with 0% VAT, which is really nice for clients as well. And your client doesn't need, uh, doesn't have the responsibility uh, as an importer or brand. Um, this, is, this is just an example of, of what a supply chain could look like for, for a company. So, for example, you are really happy with your Scandinavian distributor, they will probably like it if they can order from a European stock rather than from a US stock. But you can also ship to end users, which would normally not be within your reach. And not every country can be covered with a distributor because you can find the right one. So then you have the option to sell online, for example, to businesses or to consumers, uh, and, but also, for example, to uh, small independent stores. If you're into the consumer products, then really nice that you have opened up this sales channel as well. Um, yeah, so uh, <coughs> it is a big step, uh, that's, that's for sure, because then uh, if, if you are used to doing your own logistics here in, in, uh, in the US and you start working with an overseas uh, warehouse, then uh, it, it does imply a big step and a lot of management time and committed resources to it. So most companies, they, they choose to, to outsource that to a third-party logistics company, um, which has obvious advantages. The first advantage is you don't have to find your own real estate, rent or buy a warehouse, and employ people to do the fulfillment, uh, which is a lot of investment, and it's always too little or too much. So if your market really grows, then probably your warehouse is too small at some point. The other way around happens unfortunately more often, and you're stuck with a lot of space and too many people. Um, <clears throat> what I want to point out is uh, the sophistication of logistics service providers in Europe. They know the landscape, so they know how to deliver quickly and cost-effectively uh, to clients. Um, they can combine resources with other clients, so we have a lot, in the Netherlands we have a lot of multi-user warehouses in e-fulfillment, for example, it's not uncommon that one fulfillment company has 100 clients or more within 
the same warehouse products are scattered around, like in an Amazon warehouse. Um, but um, uh, they would charge you only by the activity that they would do. So uh, they would receive a container, which is a certain X amount of euros, put it on stock, pick and pack, uh, and expect a parcel carrier on your behalf, or if you don't have a parcel carrier, that's fine as well. So it's, it's, it's very flexible. And I think that's, that's the main point here, that um, outsourcing logistics makes the fixed costs variable. So if you have a lot of growth in your, your logistics costs, they will grow along. But if the sales are not as good as you would have hoped, then your logistics costs are low as well. Set of costs, it's mo mostly management time. So finding the right partner, uh, signing a contract, um, just understanding each other, they understand the products, you understanding how they work, and then the setup costs are, are very limited in general. Of course, there are companies that do logistics themselves, which can have very good reasons. It can be a strategic choice, they want to have control of the whole supply chain. Of course, that's a good, good reason, especially when they're good at logistics. And nowadays, some online retailers are better at logistics than logistics companies, and then they become logistics companies. The most obvious example, I think, is Amazon. Um, they have the volumes, obviously, uh, and if there is certainty about uh, what you will sell the next few years, then it, it doesn't always make sense to give part of the margin to a retail as well. So uh, then, then definitely uh, companies can, can choose to do it themselves. <coughs> so now we get to the most fun part. This is Rotterdam, by the way. I'm not sure uh, if you've been there uh, before. I know you've been there to uh, pick up a car. Um, this is Rotterdam. This is not the port. This is the city. But you can see the River Rhine. And it runs all the way to Switzerland. And it has navigable waterways all the way to Switzerland. So big vessels come in. They put it on smaller vessels. This is not a container barge, but they, they pretty much look alike, only with containers. They can ship them up, uh, up to Germany and uh, all the way to Switzerland. Um, what they all benefit from is the customs and VAT regime in the Netherlands. Um, unfortunately, even though we are one single market, the VAT regimes and the customs authorities are very different from country to country. They do abide to general regulations on EU level, but the national translation is very different. Um, in some countries, they see it as a way to protect their market. We also protect our market, but we also try to facilitate trade because it's a major, you know, it's our bread and butter, trading and logistics. So we need to make sure that goods come in and goods go out and uh, that it runs smoothly. <coughs> so there are uh, two different taxes to take into account when the product is uh, imported. One is the import duties, which is an actual cost. Uh, it is the same for all of Europe, so it doesn't matter into what country you import. Uh, it differs from product to product, uh, and we've seen that it's a little bit too dynamic nowadays, with uh, trade wars uh, <coughs> going on, or we have the risk of trade wars. Um, as an example, last year I was working on a project for, uh, for, for yachts, pleasure vessels. It looked very promising and we were connecting them to logistics partners and then suddenly there was a 20% import duty because of uh, what was decided here and in Brussels and the project was killed because it killed their margin and there was no longer a level playing field for them in Europe. So just as an example, what is, uh, what is quite nice is it's possible to get, uh, get, to get a, a binding tariff Dutch customs, this is my product, we think it's this HS code, and then they can confirm it, or say, no, it's not an HS code, <laughs> but at least you have certainty for a number of years. So as a company, that's a benefit. Then there's value-added tax, which is a consumption tax. Um, it differs from country to country. In the Netherlands, it's 21%, but it's not necessarily a cost for the company, because it's a consumption tax, and only the consumer will pay. 
every part of the chain needs to refine it. Well, um, in an analyst we say you prefinance it and then you get it back. That's not necessarily the most trade facilitating way. So we have different options and we have a clip for that. Um, it's, it's a bit of a complex uh, subject, so we yeah. try to put it in easiest terms possible and we asked the computer to explain it, basically. <laughs> in the Netherlands then you have uh, maybe every three months you do a VAT return and then you say okay I have paid VAT at the border uh, you need a license for this it's easy to obtain but you can also you can choose to not do it and then you just pay it at the border and put it on your periodical VAT returns and then after uh, a couple of weeks you get it back which is quite quick in some countries in Europe it can take up to six months or even longer to get it back so that's a huge cash flow disadvantage all cash and it's a lot because 21% of the product value is a lot that you cannot use for other things and when you expand it to Europe then probably you can use all the cash you need for other things right 
So, um, so Stan, so that, that's for all the countries in Europe. So if, if you it goes to the Netherlands and you sell the end to consumers in France, you, you don't you don't worry about it multiple times. You take care as long as you have one of the three logistics, the you know an attorney or. Yeah, if you have a fiscal representative that right. uh, that can help you with that VAT deferment, you don't have to worry about paying VAT upon import. Or if you sell it to a businesses afterwards, if you sell it to consumers, that's different because then you have to collect VAT. Okay. But then you actually have a positive cash flow right. because then you collect the money and then it takes a while before you pay it to the fiscal authorities. Okay. So you can well, there's not a lot of interest nowadays, but you could collect interest. And uh, this is, by the way, the same for Dutch and European entities. This is not, not just for overseas companies. And uh, it's, it's actually quite shocking to see that even Dutch companies do, do not all know this. When did it start? A long time ago? long time ago. The fiscal responsibility. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And it's uh, actually, in most of our projects, we find a combination of a logistics company and a fiscal representative. Those two together for an exporting company is, is sufficient to organize the supply chain. In some cases, the, the larger logistics companies, they operate as a service as well. So Peter, are these the kinds of things that you would help facilitate with US to Europe to find the folks that would? So what typically mm -hmm. happens is that uh, a company uh, with an interest to uh, uh, import from here into the Netherlands or into Europe would ask us business development related questions and then this would come up and then I would probably call Sven. Okay. <laughs> say, or Sam, or any of the others that are just now quiet and waiting, uh, who also cover these topics like the deferment specifically. So that I know it is there, but I couldn't give them any specific advice on it other than say, let me get someone on the phone, let's have a joint call, and, and then sort of explain the whole issue and see how we can work it out. Yeah, we, this is what I like about this platform. We often think the logistics is actually easy part of going to Europe. The hard part is selling the product and getting it certified and getting through the regulatory issues for chemicals, for example, getting to reach is, is quite, quite, a, you know, quite, quite something. Uh, but selling the product online is not easy either. I mean, it's a global marketplace, so everyone is on there. How do you get your products market? So, um, so I think that's, that's where it's difficult for a company to go to Europe. This can be organized. As long as you know the right route, basically. Very briefly, uh, we talked about value added tax. Uh, Deloitte, uh, you must all know them. Uh, they looked at all 28 European Union countries and they looked at their VAT regimes and they scored them. So, what you see here is an index score, maximum 15, of uh, what Deloitte thinks are attractive VAT regimes. And they say the Netherlands is by far the most attractive VAT regime. Part of it is due to that VAT deferment uh, option, obviously, but also the complexity and the time that you are, that it takes to do your VAT filings is, is limited compared to other countries. And uh, customs is scoring quite well as well. Customs in the Netherlands, they like to get product through as quickly as possible because we don't have the space for a small country to stack it full with, uh, with containers product needs to move and they uh, want to facilitate those flows. So the United Nations, they, they looked at uh, a lot of countries, I think uh, yeah, almost 120 countries, and how they facilitate trade, and they say the Netherlands is really a model country when it comes to dig digitization of the customs process, the limited number of formalities that needs to be uh, done, uh, the transparency, and just, just the way it's organized and how they work with businesses to to help them with their imports and exports. Um, okay. <clears throat> so this uh, this is uh, something we've been talking about for a while because it's uh, it's going to have a massive impact on supply chains, existing supply chains. Brexit. Um, this this little uh, cartoon shows the European Union, which is a, a massive vessel. Uh, cruise ship, if you will, it's quite comfortable, uh, to be honest, uh, to be in the European Union. It does quite well, but it's hard to navigate, it's hard to steer. 
we're all aware of that. It's hard work to, uh, to uh, integrate the European Union. And the UK said, we're going to leave the European Union and we're going to rule the waves like we did in the old days. <laughs> so this is, this is basically how it started. And um, it's, it's two years ago that, uh, that uh, there was a vote. And after that, it became clear there are a couple of options that we're looking at. So this, uh, this little image shows the level of integration options between the UK and the European Union. On the left side, this is the least integrated option. So there's no not a single market exit anymore. There are no common rules. Uh, the UK becomes a third country, if you will. So it becomes like a Zimbabwe or <laughs> any, any third country that has no bilateral trade agreement with Europe. Um, so that, that will be really, really nasty when that happens because then uh, we, we start back at uh, you know, 50 or even more years ago. On the, well, completely right is EU membership, which is full integration. So free transfer or, or movement of goods and people and capital, uh, which is the current situation actually. And between there are various options. Uh, the Norway option is one that uh, pops up quite, uh, quite often. It is quite integrated, but they need to abide to a lot of EU regulations, which is exactly what the UK doesn't want. So this is not very likely. Um, I want to point out the bilateral uh, option, uh, CEDA, the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement between Canada and the EU, is, is such an example, where the tariffs are 0% for most products, and there's actually uh, a lot of regulations that are valid both ways. So it makes it a lot easier. Like the savings stuff, does it fall under the Canada? Uh, no, but uh, you can uh, more quickly um, obtain a CE mark when you are already certified in uh, Canada. So yeah, and it's easier to, for example, uh, export food products. And a lot of regulations or, or certifications are, they are acknowledged on both sides. And uh, we, we just came from uh, Toronto and Ottawa. and. Um, well, obviously they are a, a little bit uh, shocked uh, on what happened uh, in recent years with their main trading partner, where there was a bit of uncertainty. So they are looking now at other, other places to export. And Europe, because of CETA, is actually uh, quite easy uh, to, to get product there. And uh, because it's a 0% tariff, they're on a, quite a level playing field now with European companies. Anyway, um, that could be something that in the future, UK and the European Union will agree to, but now there's just too little time. So there's a, there's a status quo, and you may have heard from what's happening in, in the UK. They're mostly dealing with themselves to find out what they really want. And they go back to the EU and they say, can we make a talk? But there's no real uh, new uh, ideas on, on how a deal could be, uh, could be made. So this is the status quo. Um, here you see uh, two rabbits, uh, Miss May and uh, Mr. Corbin. They are staring in the headlights of a no deal Brexit, and it's actually too late to get out of the way. Uh, this is from, uh, from our newspaper, one of our newspapers uh, from last weekend. So this is really, really what's happening. They are still talking to each other mainly, uh, but a no deal Brexit is actually almost unavoidable. Um, <clears throat> why is it unavoidable? There's just too many things that they cannot agree on, and it's only agreed when everything is agreed. And the hardest uh, thing, and I won't go into that, uh, is the North of Irish uh, matter, uh, where there's going to be a border, but they don't want it to be a hard border, but it's impossible because then they would still be part of uh, the European Union uh, region. So basically, what we're uh, now going for, which is most likely, and I, you know, no one has a crystal ball and we don't know what's happening behind uh, the curtains. Uh, but I do believe the bookmakers in, uh, in England. Uh, normally you bet on sports, uh, but now you can also bet on Brexit. <laughs> and they say a no deal is most likely. Um, so a no deal Brexit at March 29th, um, where they, they fall out of the European Union with nothing in place. That basically means they go back to regulations and 
that will be chaos because then there will be a border and uh, uh, that will, like I said, that will really disrupt uh, supply chains. There is an option still that there will be a transitional agreement where both sides say we're, we have a, uh, a temporary agreement in place which gives us about 18 to 20 months extra time to negotiate a trading agreement, which is this uh, uh, scenario where you can see that there will be a time to negotiate, but still it is very limited this time. It's less time, uh, 18 months, than what they had now. And up until now, they, there is basically nothing has been agreed. So uh, for companies, this means even if there will be a deal, a temporary agreement, they still need to change their supply chains. Um, the contingency plan, if there's a no deal, they could say, you know, it's it's going to be chaos for all of us. Let's say we change nothing, but that should be last minute, and it's a question if that's even, even possible. Um, yeah, so we'll see. Uh, we, we work towards this. We prepare for the worst, and that means that in a little more than a month, there will be a new border between the UK and the Netherlands and all other European Union countries. So what does that mean? Uh, that means that we will have customs obligations. Now we have thousands of trucks going from the Netherlands to the UK and back daily. Also TNT trucks, uh, of course. Um, they suddenly have to deal with customs where there's no none. So uh, that means that they have to uh, send customs declarations. We expect an increase of 30% in customs declarations every day in the Netherlands just because of this new border. There's not enough uh, declaration officers to deal with that. So we try to uh, digitize a lot, but again, there's very little time. Especially for food and veterinary products, um, they, will, they must be checked thoroughly. It's not an option to not do that. So there's a good risk that there's going to be a massive traffic jam at every port of trucks uh, with, uh, with produce and animals, etc. And uh, for a lot of companies, uh, those import tariffs are, are really scary. Um, so suddenly where there's no, not, a, not even an import, uh, there's going to be an import and there's going to be a 20% uh, tariff on top of So what we uh, see now, and especially um, for North American companies, the UK has always been something of a launch pad for Europe. Mm -hmm. There's of course the, the language uh, proximity. Um, it is an interesting market, so a lot of companies, they, they once in the past decided, let's start in the UK, and from there we grow into Europe. And they stuck with that model, so they uh, service their European cl clients from the UK, now we see that a lot of those companies are choosing for a second distribution location um, you know, in the mainland. So they split their stock, they build up extra stock on both sides just to make sure that they can keep servicing their customers. Uh, what we expect that that's a temporary solution, it will move to a, to a model where those companies uh, will service like a lot of companies already do. They service the European market from a mainland location because that's where the biggest market is. And then they ship it uh, to the UK, hopefully at some point when, when there's a customs agreement or a customs union or bilateral trade agreement in place. So what can you do as a company? Uh, it is important to know how your goods flow. So do they flow through the UK to Europe already? Then it's definitely time to divert that. What could be the potential tariffs for my goods? Do I source myself within the UK? And, uh, <coughs> and I think the most practical thing is uh, talk to a logistic, your logistics partner. Can they offer bonded warehousing, for example? Um, do they have a contingency plan in place? Uh, just make sure that you don't get surprised on April 1st with, uh, with goods being stuck at the border. Well, I'm, I'm running over my time, so I'm just going to through these real quick. I think we talked about most of them. Um, why is the Netherlands the gateway for goods? It is a main entry point. It is centrally located between the main markets. It has excellent connectivity. 
talk about the fiscal and business environment, and we also speak English, so mm -hmm. that should be, not be a barrier either. Um, we have a very competitive logistics industry uh, that, that makes us cost, effect, cost efficient as well. And uh, we always try to, to uh, become better at it, because it is a small country, we need to be really efficient, and um, we, we have a lot of innovative solutions in the supply chain and logistics uh, field to make sure that, uh, that we stay that way. So how can we help? You can help by asking questions or, or answering questions. Um, we do matchmaking with the logistics companies, fiscal representatives. We can organize a fact-finding trip for companies. So if they want to learn more about the logistics landscape and meet with potential logistics partners, we can uh, organize that, facilitate that. And we work in close cooperation with the Netherlands Foreign Investment Agency, which is a uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or Economic Affairs uh, of the Netherlands. They have offices across the US, also here in Washington, and uh, they help US companies with their uh, investments in, uh, in the Netherlands. And when it revolves around logistics, we are involved. So that was, that was my presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for your attention. Mm. Sorry, I took a bit more time. No, that was good. You had hard stuff to present. We're doing Brexit and that. <laughs> Jeez. I, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna sit down now. And, uh, take it home now. Now. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, wh what what would you prefer? Would you prefer now to sort of go into a couple of details or ask some questions or? Would you rather move on uh, and get our experts that are hopefully somewhere <laughs> waiting on screen for us? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think experts. we move on. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. the experts because yeah. they're probably they're probably sleeping. <laughs> 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 Wake up. Okay, could could you help me on it? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Peggy. Would you like to take a look? But you can imagine that we're not at all happy. It's messy and it's crazy. a drawback for, <laughs> for Europe. Uh, it's an important economy. So, I didn't see uh, the angle to say, let's forget it all. Let's yeah, just, yeah, that's what, yeah, this was a dumb idea. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, just kidding, kidding right? Yeah. 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 Well, it's April 1st. I mean, and the day could say, this has all been a big joke. It's, it's still what I hope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have. Uh, screen waiting for us and uh, um, if, if I may talk to them for a while uh, I, I see a few heads that I that I recognize uh, uh, please be aware also Charlie who's, uh, who's this guy over here doing the dangerous goods packaging and labeling and of course he had a little bit of questions saying well but who is who is in the room and is that a topic for them dealing with the dangerous goods. It's all being put on, uh, what is it? Is it Facebook. On yes. Facebook <laughs> date. So, uh, so I would just take your chance and uh, tell what you have to tell because it's not only the audience that's sitting here that's, uh, that's going to take notice of, uh, of what, what you want to share with us. Where, who, who, who likes to start? John, as I've been talking to you, why don't you pick it up and, and tell us about what you do uh, and anything that you would like to share with us uh, in the I don't know, five or seven minutes. Just you un to un unmute, unmute your, your mic. Good afternoon and thank you for having me over there. And a uh, good morning, I say to you, for us this afternoon. Yes. Um, we are on labeling dangerous goods labels, and I'm not sure if uh, in the audience, but I understand we are also on a live stream, so we don't really know if there are chemical suppliers who, who I'm talking to, the, the people who are uh, delivering or supply dangerous goods. Because we are a supplier of dangerous goods labels, um, I'm not aware of if there are, are any sheets uh, available, Peter. 
I can't see them because I had uh, some slides for you, but if not, I tell let, it. Let me check. Where is uh, uh, where is uh, your room uh, at this uh, point? <laughs> well, I, in the meantime, I tell that I we the we supply dangerous goods, but uh, in fact, not only the labels. Attached to our labels is our knowledge, and um, it's inevitable you need any knowledge uh, about if you uh, about uh, transporting dangerous goods if you are in that field. And uh, we know how to use and produce uh, dangerous goods labels for your products. And that's uh, that's very important to know about legislation. Um, for instance, um, in uh, the US, you have the Department of Transport and the Department of Labor. They have their own legislation for the USA. Uh, in Europe, we have also, we have the Europe Community, which provides us with legislation. But as you understand from some, every country has its own legislation itself. Um, both are from uh, the legislation from the United Nations, uh, as well as in, uh, uh, ah, where are the sheets? The first sheet, yeah, please, thank you. Um, in fact, uh, if you look at both leg legislations, uh, the US and the EU both agree to the UN legislation, but are very, uh, they, they vary in their a specific legislation. So the US uh, has its own legislation uh, according to Europe. That's, uh, that's for the Department of Transport uh, for you and for the Department of Labor. And we accordingly uh, go to the Europe legislation. Even in Europe, which is 28, 28 yeah. I say already 27 uh, countries, um, are all, uh, have all, also their own legislation. Well, that, that wouldn't hold you back to don't go to Europe. Please do, because we can help you with providing uh, the good la the, uh, the right labels for the right uh, products you uh, uh, you provide and you want to supply in Europe. I think I keep it from here if there are any questions. Yes, please. Uh, uh, Jeroen, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but the, the, the sheets are, are changing so quickly. Mm -hmm. Could you could yeah, slow that down? I'm trying to figure out why they're doing that, because I, uh, okay. I disabled the function, but apparently it's still doing it. So <laughs> I, I think it might be because there's also like some remote control going on, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, I'm, I'm checking up on it. I'll okay. <laughs> Tell me, what, what, do you have currently any experience with with uh, with U.S. companies coming in, and, and what, what are the, the, the main issues that, that they um, face? Or? Yes, we do have. We uh, we will. Um, um, uh, the Dutch. Uh, I'm sorry, for I will say that the Dutch uh, um, yeah, importers for U.S. products. Um, uh, approaching us to ask us to help the American customer, uh, customers to give a good uh, good label. Uh, for instance, we have. Uh, uh, can I call names? Uh, are you your, uh, U.S. names? If, is that all right? Uh, for I for instance, Ken Ken in from Pennsylvania is uh, is using our knowledge to uh, uh, to let to uh, the uh, to produce the labels in Europe, and uh, there is a big warehouse in uh, in Rotterdam who are who is uh, distributing the, the goods for them, and we provide them with the labels on the goods. And that way, it's much easier to uh, to uh, supply labels uh, in Europe, which are um, uh, compliant with the uh, EU legislation. Does that answer your question? Yes, uh, Tony. Thank you so much. Uh, let's move on to as as we we finished up, sort of with the the VAT topic. Maybe Peter.
Victor, if, if you could introduce yourself briefly and, 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 uh, and whatever you would like to be, uh, maybe you followed the discussion, but we had some information on fiscal representation and VAT deferment. Uh, we had a few times where we dealt with, with you on, on these topics. So why did you introduce yourself and tell a little bit more about it? Yes, um, thank you all for having this opportunity to talk to you. Um, now live as well as uh, streaming video. Um, so thank you for listening. At this moment, there's little to add. I really enjoyed the presentation, so uh, compliments from our side. If a party from the US um, will be providing services or will be exporting goods, to Europe, um, indeed, one of the first tax issues he will be confronted with is the VAT and his customs. It's not, the VAT system can be more or less compared to the US sales tax, but it's different. It's, um, simple. yeah, thank you. It's it's not a cost, but it's a formality that must be dealt with. And in case you obtain good advice on beforehand, um, it, is rel it can be relatively easy to deal with. In case you do not, <laughs> and you simply start trading, then it can become a pain in the ass. Um, also because the Netherlands is a rather efficient country with regards to and flexible with regards to taxes. Uh, the Dutch tax authorities are willing to cooperate. But there are certain European countries that are completely different. So before you start doing business in Europe, um, talk to a tax advisor. It can be us, it can be another party. Um, choose whoever you want to. But talk about the VAT aspects and custom duties, although custom duties is not really that different. Simply, the custom duties are due on certain products. On our sheet, we mentioned that in case you appoint a VAT representative, um, sometimes you are obliged to appoint a VAT representative, um, most formalities are dealt with by that party. So then you can focus on doing your business and you don't have to bother about VAT. Um, then we also mentioned that a, in case you export goods to Europe and you keep them in a warehouse um, in, or in case you keep them on stock, that does not trigger uh, more tax complications. It simply sticks to remain with uh, VAT and customs. And finally, we mentioned that you can have your uh, employee carrying out services in Europe without um, resulting in a branch for corporate income tax or other tax purposes. Um, if I summarize it, if structured correctly, your tax liabilities, your tax difficulties in Europe will be minimal. I think that's it from my side. Do Thank you, you. Are you expecting, Peter, uh, uh, a, a lot of this disruption in your own work with when it would be the no deal Brexit? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we are. Yeah, for sure. And um, well, it's it's really going to be messy if, um, um, in case of a hard Brexit, transactions between the mainland and uh, UK, which is also a large economy, uh, re will result in a lot of formalities. 
maybe even more than when you guys are exporting from, from US to Europe. So uh, um, yes, that's going to be a lot of hassle, Peter. Mm. Could you say a few words about uh, your own your own company and uh, and your experience with with US companies? Yes, we can. Um, we are a boutique tax advisory firm. We focus on providing tax advisory services to a wide range of clients, varying from um, self-employed people to uh, several uh, stockbroker companies. We also serve several clients from the US. Um, and with regards to those clients, I can say that um, they should they should take off their US glasses <laughs> and put on their European glasses because yeah, it's a different world here. Um, different kind of taxation. There's it's not that difficult, but it is different. Um, before tr starting to trade, try to understand our system of taxation, and we are happy to help you. I normally always I think about that in, in terms of product, but is that also on software as a solution and technology and cyber? And can you speak to that a bit on how that works? That VAT, value added tax, is levied on consumption, consumption of goods, consumption of services. So that means if you are providing services from US to European based clients, you will be faced, you will be confronted with the VAT system. Um, you, as the exporter of goods or, or services, are obliged to levy VAT on the services for selling those goods. And uh, and you arrange for the compliance to report it and to pay it to the respective European tax authority. But do people do people price that they say here's the price and in addition to VAT is that how it works normally with the, with the pricing? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, when you sell a service or a product. To, a, uh, to an individual who cannot reclaim the VAT, then you always mention uh, the price including VAT. That's the amount he has to pay, and that's the um, uh, and he cannot reclaim VAT, so he is not interested in the VAT included in the purchase price. But in case you sell goods to a uh, to an entrepreneur, a VAT entrepreneur. That VAT entrepreneur can reclaim any VAT that is charged. So he's not really interested whether whether the price is uh, 100 or 110. He wants to know the price without VAT. Um, so he wants to know if the net price is 90 or 100. And he is he does not really bother about 10% VAT or 20% VAT. That's the plane. Okay, I'm sorry. Does that answer your question? Yeah, one, one, so one more, and I'll you shut up. But so I thought the the VAT was always paid by the person or the, the entity that consumed it. Who? I don't, what I don't understand then is who are these people that don't have to or entities that don't have to care about VAT if they're the ultimate consumer of the service? It's um, it's a system whereby. Uh, entrepreneurs charge VAT on outgoing products and services, and they are uh, they reclaim any VAT that is charged to them. Um, so for the entrepreneur himself, the VAT is not a cost. He simply adds VAT to outgoing services and products. At a certain moment, there will be an ultimate client that cannot reclaim the VAT that has been charged to him. And that's the consumer. 
at that moment, the VAT is charged by the entrepreneur who is selling the goods or services to the ultimate consumer, and the ultimate consumer is not reclaiming it. And that's the moment when the VAT is actually collected by the tax authorities. So I guess it gets a little bit more complicated when it would be a U.S. company selling to a governmental organization in wherever, the Netherlands or... Yeah, there are all kinds of exemptions. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That. I also yeah. see that... I, don't want to, yeah, I do not want to complicate matters. No, I simply, simply talk to a European tax advisor with some basic knowledge of VAT before doing business. Yeah. That's our advice. Yeah. And the fiscal representation, is that something that, that you would also offer as a service or are, is that more at the, at the 3PL, at the logistics side that they would handle that? Yeah, you are right. That's more, uh, more a service of the, the logistic providers. Yeah. Yeah. They act as the fiscal representative. Right. I believe we have one or two clients that we act for as a fiscal representative. But in principle, this is taken care of by the, yeah, by the transporters, yeah. the logistic companies. Right. Okay, thanks. And they sir. have sufficient knowledge, so they can guide you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Peter. I, I, I understand how, how difficult it is to sort of <laughs> talk, talk, talk to a webcam and not really see how we respond, but <laughs> you did very well. Thank you so much. And I also see a non- uh, you, US to your member on there that I know. Uh, I haven't met her in person, but I see Shirley with her with her Melski, who is in uh, in uh, Wisconsin, with her mic closed uh, as she sh as she shoot, which is very good. But Shirley, if you can hear us, mm -hmm. if there are any questions from your end, please do not hesitate to to unmute your mic and mm -hmm. ask whatever you like. I'm glad you're here and have joined us. Uh, Michelle, thank, thank you so much for your patience up until now. Uh, Amazon came, came by a, a, a few times, so I, I know that is a, a topic that uh, some people would like to hear your opinion on, but, but please take, take some time to, to introduce yourself, tell, tell who you are, what you do. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, so my name is Michelle Willems, and uh, I'm co-founder of H1. We started as a web development agency, but we help our clients to be uh, successful with e-commerce in Europe, uh, and we work for both SME companies as um, uh, corporates like Mercedes-Benz, Nike, and uh, Unilever. Um, yeah, um, well, you, Peter, you asked me to uh, to give. A short introduction in the market entry strategy with e-commerce in, in Europe. Um, I won't bother you too long because it should be short. Uh, I'll share a couple of uh, slides for a moment, and it takes it will be a short and painless uh, <laughs> affair. It takes just a couple of minutes. Um, well, I I won't talk too much about uh, figures, but as told before, uh, Europe is. Uh, is a large market and uh, e-commerce is becoming like everywhere in the world there is no uh, exception um, e-commerce is becoming more uh, more important um, and I think it depends a little bit on what kind of company uh, you are but in most cases although you could be B2B or B2C um, e-commerce can be part of your entry uh, strategy um, Okay, maybe the easiest way to uh, enter a, a market, if you don't want to invest too much in your own, um, let's say, uh, technical infrastructure, your own e-commerce platform, uh, and more importantly, uh, your um, new marketing, it would be great to, to start with selling through a platform. And that can be, for instance, Amazon, and you know them. Um, you see some figures here, there are some uh, Dutch text, but what it says is the um, percentage of people buying in different countries through uh, online marketplaces. And as you see in China, 
we're not talking about China today, but then again, um, most well, the most turnover in uh, in e-commerce is done through uh, platforms, through marketplaces. And there are not a lot of independent web shops. Um, totally below, you see Holland, the Netherlands, and there the percentage uh, of sales through online uh, marketplaces is rather small in comparison to other countries. So if you focus on consumers in Europe, uh, selling only through Amazon, well, is probably smart, but you don't reach everybody. And uh, besides Amazon, there are some local heroes. Uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, um, they're not among the 10 biggest uh, platforms. Uh, so if you want to sell your goods to consumers through platforms, and you want to focus on, the, on on Europe, it's good to see if there are more local players. And well, if you need some help, you can always call us. Um, another way to uh, to enter the market is direct to consumer, um, but be aware. Uh, prepare for an enormous uh, marketing budget. Uh, most consumer good companies are selling through distributors, wholesalers, retailers, uh, and sometimes in com a combination of direct to consumer. Uh, but if you really focus on consumers, or you have a very specific niche, or bring a suitcase full of dollars uh, <laughs> and spend it on the market. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not so sure if you can pay in cash though, but uh, okay. Um, then, uh, for those people over there, who have a B2B product uh, that can be focused on wholesalers, retailers who sell to consumers or to uh, professional users. Um, actually, I think when we just started 20 years ago, B2B e-commerce was hardly existing. Uh, nowadays, uh, what we see in, in some industries is that you are neglected if you don't offer any uh, way to order online. Uh, and I think it's rapidly chasing everywhere in the world, so also in Europe. Um, in some cases, uh, people want to order online, but not through your website, but uh, with their own uh, purchasing system or EDI system or something like that. Um, so like in a lot of places in the world, <laughs> Asia a little bit less, Africa uh, even less. Um, well, being prepared for e-commerce and uh, is is important uh, in Europe in the B two B sector as well. Um, and especially if you sell, for instance, to Dutch government, um, they have their purchasing systems, and they don't want to log in on your, in your web shop. They um, they log in in their own system, they select a provider, and then what you do is actually, they, they log in in your website without them knowing it. They choose what they want to order, and that's sent to their procurement system. I don't know if you have any experience with it, uh, punch out systems, but what we see it as, well, the fastest growing part of B2B e-commerce in, uh, in at least in the, in the north of, uh, Europe and Holland, Germany, Scandinavia. Um, okay, having told about uh, uh, you a little bit about e-commerce, do we have to uh, send the salesman away? I don't think so, uh, especially in B2B e-commerce. Um, it starts with a relationship, it starts with being there, showing your face and things like that. And, and, uh, from the moment on that you have a relationship and if you sign a contract, then e-commerce is a way to uh, make ordering more efficient and, and things like that. Um, but um, yeah, we believe that B2B e-commerce without traditional salesmen is less successful. Um, yeah, these are my uh, couple of minutes. Any questions? Don't be shy. I'm here. So, were you were you going to say anything on uh, on on Amazon 
or was yeah uh, what what I, what I just said is um, okay I can uh, I really can uh, inform you more in depth in how to be more successful on platforms like Amazon um, however if you want to um, enter the European market be aware that Amazon is a important uh, platform uh, but not the only uh, platform um, especially in the, in the Netherlands, uh, it doesn't have a very big market share. In Germany, it has. Um, if you want to enter the market by Amazon, it's well. Uh, there are uh, several ways to do it. Uh, you can uh, let them do the uh, the fulfillment, as the first speaker already uh, told. So that's the reason I decided not to go too deep into that okay. uh, and you can uh, decide to sell through Amazon and uh, send it from this in the States or you can outsource it to a local fulfillment party. The good thing about Amazon is that uh, by being a seller uh, you can uh, be on all their European uh, markets uh, and uh, well, there are some ways to optimize a little bit your product descriptions uh, and to be found over there, to get more reviews, etc. Uh, etc. Et um, if there are very specific questions about it, uh, maybe drop an, an email uh, or, or contact me because otherwise I uh, keep you all waiting. We're a little bit over time, uh, I believe. So. Super. I, I understand yeah. and I appreciate that, uh, Michel. Thank you so much uh, for that. So, um, for some closing remarks uh, for me, first of all, uh, one could sort of have a separate session of a whole day on, yeah. on how to do business yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, in another country. We, we, we do that with companies uh, uh, also in, uh, in the Netherlands. If I would have to summarize it to do this in, in sort of one minute, I would uh, I would like to uh, I guess an expression that you know is which is abbreviated. I don't know how you pronounce it, but when you see what you see is what you get. With you, uh, with you. With you. Okay. So I think if you would like to summarize the mindset, if you go to other countries or if you go into Europe, would be what you see is something else instead of what you see is what you get and and once you and and we have the same thing happening as well as please understand that i'm from a country and i'm all the way in the west if i want to cross a border it will take me no more than an hour and a half or maybe two hours maximum so to the south it's in, within 75 minutes i cross a border and, and when i go east it, it will take me maybe two hours and once I cross that border, it's all different. It's all different. And even if I go south to Belgium, where they basically speak the same language when I cross the border, it's all different. And so that is why I see what you see is something else. It really is. And even, maybe for you it's even easier, because for the Dutch, for instance, doing Belgium with their neighbors speaking the same language, you think, well, you're not aware of all the differences because you speak the same language. But then again, you don't, because it's all different. What you see is something else. It's really, it's really like that. So uh, it's also the attitude of uh, sort of conquering the area. You like to look at the big blots on the map. Germany is huge, and France is huge. We're we're very small in the Netherlands, but we have the same size of the economy like Pennsylvania. So uh, even if you Cover, cover only that little ground to sell on, let alone the logistical part of it. It's really a really dense area, and, and, and Stan showed the blue banana. It's those are really dense areas. So even if you concentrate and focus on that area, you can be extremely successful. You don't sort of have to. If if the, for us, of course, for the Dutch, the German market is very important. And so the first thing that we do when we speak with companies going to Germany don't come to Germany, you're going to now with us discuss where you're going into Germany because it's
it's so huge that there's no way that you can cover that, that ground in one go. You start somewhere, you concentrate on that area, and then you move on. And, and it will be the same for any company moving into the US zone. It will be the same story. Um, to pick out one topic, and I, I hope uh, Jeroen, who is, who is somewhere there, can hear me and can, can put online the, the link in. Very good, Jeroen. Thank you. Um, this is one thing that I want to point out. Uh, as I said, we do a lot with Germany. Um, Jeroen, who is who's handling all the, the, the buttons at the areas, my uh, used to control, um, has, has an online assisted me in developing this into a service. So I put it next to LinkedIn. Of course, everyone knows LinkedIn, but Germany wouldn't be Germany if they wouldn't have their own LinkedIn, <laughs> which is called Xing. Don't ask me why it's called Xing. It started out, I think, about 20 years ago, and uh, it, it, it has, has a reason. It's a, it's a, um, uh, a company that is a, a shareholder uh, a company, so they have shares uh, These numbers keep changing, so it might be, if you look at the, at the current situation, it might be a little bit different, but you see at least that they're still bigger than LinkedIn uh, in Germany. It's also being used in, in Switzerland, also being used in Austria. Um, we have developed it as a service because what I keep hearing, and which annoys me a bit, but that might be because I'm from the old school, is when you want to do something online, people say, yeah, but you need to develop content. threshold which withholds you from doing stuff. Where we find that Xing is very helpful is to establish contact. So what we now do for uh, com for non-German companies, and also we can do that for US companies, we establish a profile on Xing, we help them do that in German, so it's like a pseudo website if you will, and then start adding contacts to, to their profile. One example is where we helped a, a US, uh, they developed uh, stainless steel. Uh, we developed a profile for them. Uh, we started contacting companies. Uh, and within, I think, five, six months, we, we contacted roughly 300, uh, uh, let's say, relevant contacts. And we were able to get roughly about 10 serious leads out of it. So we're assisting the agents who that they're a European agent, and so it seems to work very well without developing content, if you will. The only content that you develop is your own profile, and then you start going at approaching people when you do this in a, in a proper way and not abusing it, and get a very good response. So I won't go into anything else, I just wanted to mention that because I think it's very interesting development, and it's an interesting instrument that we've been very successful with. And you, if you could put on uh, uh, my last bit, the US to Europe slide, is that possible? He was asking what was it? Jeroen, could you, could you put on the... Yeah, I'm putting up oh, one okay. second. I'm uh, finding the, uh, the presentation. Um, there it is. At the same time? <laughs> it's just as a as a closing screen basically a bit about what is this about what you just heard so it's in these four categories trade uh, which I cover and you heard Michel uh, who is doing something completely else you heard the logistics part which is STEM you heard the tax and legal part This is a, a it's semi-governmental, right? HIDC, no? We're private. You're private, but you're partly funded by? Partly funded by. Yeah. Um, the, so the others are all uh, private commercial parties uh, that I've come to know for, for a long time. Uh, our deal is that uh, it's non-commission based, and so I typically ask them, when I give you some referrals, put it back in something in a website or put something in brochures or whatever we need for, for marketing because I'm not going to get rich on, on the commissions. So that's how we've 
organize these are the kind of services that, uh, that, that we organize. So that concludes, I think, our stories or anything that came up for questions.